Hey, what's up, folks? I'm back with round three of the 2021 National Open from Vegas, Nevada. Um, in this round, I was paired against a uh, young FIDE master from Canada, uh, Anthony Atanasov, who is about 2172 FIDE, and his USCF is a bit higher as usual, like 2260 or so. Um, and this was a real interesting game. I was definitely uh, happy with this win because I was able to kind of convert uh, an endgame. Uh, which I'm known to be pretty bad at, so kind of felt like um, it was, yeah, kind of a good good result for me. So I did very little uh, prep for this game because uh, the pairings went up pretty much 10 minutes before the round, um, but I had enough time to uh, look up his games, and I saw that he is a London player. And uh, whenever I'm paired against a London player, uh, I myself, I usually play the King's Indian, so typically in this position I would start with Knight f6 and then get Knight f3, Bishop f4, I go g6, Bishop g7, etc. Those positions I think are, are totally acceptable for black. But one thing I always like to check is what exactly the player does uh, against d6. And I think many people aren't really aware of this line, but if you're a King's Indian player and you're facing a London player, uh, this can actually be a really interesting test for that player because essentially this move comes with some advantages as we'll see and it only has one uh, significant drawback which is of course the move e4. Now personally this is part of my repertoire. I've had many games with uh, knight c6 in this position and I think this is <clears throat> totally uh, playable for black and I'm willing to go into this. But of course if you're not a perk player then you probably wouldn't be happy uh, allowing this position, and so of course that's a very significant drawback of this move order. However, when you're playing a London player, and you have you know access to their games, if you see that against d6 they are not playing e4, and instead just following up with you know typical London play like bishop f4 and knight f3, then this is actually a great way to exploit this move order, uh, because I think it gives black, again assuming you're a King's Indian player, some really interesting options. And so this is actually all I really needed to, to prep um, or to choose uh, my line for this game. I just checked what does my opponent do against d6. I found out he basically never plays e4. And uh, this is definitely a big problem for London players because if you're not willing to play e4, you do give your opponent kind of a free hand in the opening to pretty much do whatever uh, they want, knowing that you're not really going to punish them with the critical test. Not that e4 you know, here isn't playable for black, but definitely I think it offers white bigger chances for an advantage compared to what happens uh, in the game. Uh, so white played here knight f3, and now the point for black is I go g6, bishop f4, bishop g7, e3, and knight d7. And the whole point of this line is to de delay the development of the knight on g8, as this knight can actually come out to h6 or e7, and black gets very quick play with e5 and f5 in some positions where the knight on f6 is not in the way. So a big advantage in, in terms of uh, the move order here for black, because you get e5 uh, very easily, and then the knight can actually jump out to this f5 square as well, which uh, is pretty annoying for white when the bishop is uh, going back to uh, g3. So I really like this setup. I think it's a very, very interesting one uh, to play. In the game, white played bishop c4, which I think is a pretty normal move. I went e5, and yeah, now if bishop to g5, the idea for black is to play f6, but usually white takes on e5 first, let's say takes, takes, bishop g5, f6, bishop h4, knight h6, and it looks a little weird to open up this whole diagonal for white's bishop, but the point is that black is going to be able to one day cover things up, like queen e7, knight f7, this kind of thing, and you'll be able to castle, and in the meantime, white's bishop on h4 actually going to feel very much sidelined uh, against this f6 e5 uh, pawn chain as we kind of see happens in the game. 9 on f3 also is going to feel uh, quite restricted here. Uh, so in the game my opponent actually just went back immediately with bishop to g3. I continued with knight h6. So black has other options. I don't even think I play this one in the most critical way. Um, but ultimately I kind of like the, the structure we end up getting in the game. So here white plays e4, important move, stopping knight to f5. Uh, I castled, castled, queen e7. Now white goes knight d2, probably not the most accurate, um, but black's play here is pretty simple. I want to play like e5, knight c5, maybe bishop e6. I definitely want to go f6 one day, uh, starting with king h8, of course. And the point is, again, once I get this f6, e5 uh, pawn chain, it becomes very difficult for white to make use of these two pieces, bishop on g3, knight on f3. Now, of course, my knight on h6 is also 
quite a bad piece, but the difference is this knight easily gets back into the game via the f7 square, and this bishop as well can come out to h6 or even to f8 and get into the game uh, this way too, whereas white's pieces don't really have the same uh, flexibility. So I play king h8, just starting with this one felt natural, rook e1, now I played c6. This is a normal move, but I think it makes more sense when white develops the knight to c3. Here it actually feels a little bit unnecessary. I think I should have just played f6 here and started bringing the knight back into the game. And the point for black is actually to play on the queen side where I'm just going to have uh, more minor pieces in the action. And I already quite like black's position here. I think black just has an uh, incredibly comfortable game. Um, white played, uh, uh, so I played c6, white played c3, a5, a4, f6. And now he thought for a bit and played h4, which objectively maybe not the best move, but I can understand why he wanted to do this one. He's just trying to create some kingside weaknesses and get his pieces uh, into play. Um, so after some thought, I played knight to b6, and here white goes h5, uh, which definitely surprised me because I didn't think he was going to allow me to uh, take his bishop. And I was so surprised, in fact, I ended up not taking it and playing g5 which is definitely a mistake. I should have just immediately grabbed the bishop, um, getting the bishop pair and an unopposed light squared bishop. What I didn't like is that, you know, I'm kind of helping his knight get to um, the e3 square, but basically black is doing uh, fantastic in this position. This bishop on e6 is so strong, and I'm going to put a rook on d8, and pretty much any endgame or any future position, this bishop is always going to be threatening to use this b3 weakness, which not only puts pressure on the pawn, but also uh, takes the d1 square away from white's pieces, making it very hard for white to challenge for the only open file. Um, the, the reason I ended up changing my mind was because on knight b6, I kind of expected him to play bishop e2, bishop e6, and then h5. And so in my thoughts, I'm like, well, you know, and then I was going to maybe uh, consider g5 there. I figured, well, let's just play g5 first and, and see what he does. But honestly, this was just kind of silly. I should have just taken the bishop because um, that would have been objectively better. Now he does go bishop e2, bishop e6, and I was okay entering this position, but yeah, again, the other one would have promised black um, a lot more. Um, now I play knight f1, rook d8, uh, white brings this knight back to d2, and white here needs to be really careful because one day, you know, I can simply start uh, going after this h5 pawn and, and try to pick it up. Um, so he has to be uh, careful about that. In the meantime, I decided to play knight to c4. I think strategically it makes sense for me to trade some minor pieces here as um, as long as white's bishop stays on g3 locked in by the structure and I don't let him play um, f3 and bishop f2, basically white is just going to be down uh, this bishop in, in the action. And again, my knight is also bad, but it easily gets back into the game with like knight f7, knight d6, and, and so on. And the difficulty for white is that f3 blocks the bishop, which means this uh, h5 pawn would simply simply immediately be lost. So not so easy for white to play uh, f3 here. Um, so I play queen f7. I thought this was a, a very good move, just keeping an eye on the pawn and also um, just taking all of these squares under control. White goes knight f1, uh, bishop f8. Now my idea is that if the knight comes out to e3, I would play bishop to c5. If white lets me take on e3, I think strategically he's just dead lost because then his bishop is uh, simply buried and uh, I would just have like an extra piece on, on the queen side. Um, so maybe I was expecting something like knight f5, but then it takes, takes, bishop b3, and yeah, I take over the d file, white's bishop is really bad, and with my bishop on c5, it's gonna be really difficult for white to ever get f3 in, uh, under any kind of good circumstances. So uh, I pretty much evaluated this position as uh, strategically decisive for black. Um, instead he goes rook d1, which I think was uh, a very good try. Um, now I played bishop to b3. I could have also not. I think bishop d6 was a clever choice uh, suggested by the engine, just avoiding the rook trade and threatening bishop to b3. Because after bishop b3, I'm not winning any material here. White can take on d8. I definitely considered taking on c2, but after rook takes a8, I felt like this position was just uh, too messy with two rooks for the queen and um, white getting a lot of activity here, perhaps with knight e3 coming. And yeah, ultimately, I just didn't want to allow this when I felt like strategically my position made a lot of sense uh, and of course the engine actually thinks white is even better in, in this case so I'm definitely glad I avoided that one um, so I just recapture rook takes d8 and now queen c1 and surprisingly black doesn't have such a huge uh, advantage here uh, I think black has to be really really precise to, to prove anything um, my first thought here was bishop to c5 
but I didn't fully like the looks of c4, where uh, white tries to like trap the bishop with like queen c3 or knight to d2. I found this move bishop to b4, and I, I think the bishop on b3 is safe, but yeah, I wasn't 100% sure about this one, and yeah, I wasn't really wasn't really willing to go into this, um, because it felt like, yeah, maybe my bishop just gets trapped, and, and that's going to be a big problem. Um, so I decided to pull back, um, but now my opponent finds really nice move queen e3, and all of a sudden he's getting some annoying counterplay with queen coming to b6, a5 pawn is hanging, rook is hanging, and this gives him a tempo as well to play uh, rook to d1. I still felt like strategically I had the upper hand, because as long as this bishop is on g3, it feels like, you know, black just has an extra bishop on uh, the queen side. Um, now white played rook to d1. The engine points out actually f3 was quite possible here. My idea was to push b6. Then after bishop f2, bishop c5, queen to c1. I mean, I felt like, uh, you know, only black could be better here. But the engine seems to think white is uh, totally okay. But yeah, to me that was quite a strange evaluation. Because from my point of view... White's light squared bishop is, is much worse. This h5 pawn is going to have to be defended with like g4. And uh, yeah, maybe one day I can get my knight to f4. So I don't know. Strategically, again, I felt like long term black had the better chances. But okay, hard to argue with uh, with the fish. Uh, in any case, he played rook d1, which I think was more natural. I decided to go b6 so that I can take over this uh, c5 square. Yeah, rook takes d8, queen takes d8, and queen to d2 was played. Now, it looks like white is trying to just trade off all the pieces, but uh, I think it's quite logical, actually, because he really doesn't have a lot to do otherwise. And, of course, he can't really let black's queen uh, sit on the d-file for, for too long. Um, so here I thought about it a little bit. My first thought was maybe to take on d2 and go bishop c5. And after king f1, I was having a hard time really finding anything for black, because now white is ready to go f3, bishop f2, get the bishop back into the game, uh, and one day, either knight c4 or bishop c4 is going to create some counterplay on the queen side. So I realized, you know, the problem is, okay, my knight on h6 is still too far. So on queen d2, I decided to go knight f7. And the point is, if white uh, takes on d8 here, uh, which happens in the game, I'll go knight takes d8, and now my knight is in great position to go uh, to b7 and c5 and really go after this main weakness in white's position, which is the a4 pawn. I think I was also expecting uh, f3 in this position, um, but after bishop c5 check, which was my idea, bishop f2, I thought this position was a little bit unpleasant. Takes, takes, and knight d6, where I'm already threatening um, knight takes e4. For example, if I goes knight e3 and undefends the queen, then knight takes e4 is winning. Um, and if g4, for example, defending the pawn, then bishop takes g4 looks to be winning. So I felt like this position still offered black some, some reasonable chances, with my knight and bishop both kind of uh, well-placed. Um, so he ends up going for the endgame, and now he plays knight d2, which is uh, perhaps a serious uh, mistake. I think it was better to immediately uh, play f3 and just get the bishop back into the game. I'm not sure exactly what um, concerned my opponent, but uh, I was probably going to play knight b7 and knight c5, and let's say after something like bishop d1, defending the pawn, I can go b5. And it does start to get difficult for white because, um, let's say, takes, takes. Black's idea is to play knight to d3. And as you can see, my minor pieces are simply more active. I have potential of an outside pass pawn, and this one is kind of difficult for white to, uh, to deal with. So the engine actually says that white has to take on c5 in this position, uh, which is a really difficult decision to, to make because I, not only does black get the bishop pair, I also get this very annoying check uh, against the king, which has to go to the corner, I mean to the h-file, and uh, although objectively I guess white is holding this one, you know, I, I would be happy to play this position, you know, played for two results and, and try to win with the, the bishop pair. Definitely felt like during the game I would have um, significant winning chances here. As it happens, white played knight d2, uh, which uh, allows me to bring my knight to c5. And uh, now if white plays knight c4, for example, you know, the idea was simply to take knight c5, and black is just winning a pawn, and uh, probably not just one pawn, like after I take on a4, b2 will be hanging, if white plays b3, I take on e4, and now c3 is hanging, and so yeah, this just looked uh, completely losing. Um, similarly, if white tried uh, bishop c4, then my idea was to take, take, and push b5, and once again, if white takes and goes back, uh, my knight comes into c5, and this looked very, very difficult. I mean, pawn is coming to a4, I have knight d3 coming, and uh, just as a sample line, let's say 
um, f3 for example, knight d3, knight d1, e4. Uh, I believe I'm already threatening this classic endgame trick to take on b2 and uh, and push a3, which is uh, kind of a feature of the uh, the outside a pawn. Knights have a very difficult time uh, dealing with it. Um, so I already had some of these ideas on my mind. Uh, instead, white played bishop to d1. And uh, I was really happy with the move I found uh, in this position. It's kind of a nice uh, prophylactic exercise if you guys want to pause the video and think about it for a little bit. Um, I definitely could have played like knight c5 here and like b5 and again gone for this structure. Um, but given that my opponent's idea was to push f3, I decided to just set my sights on the h5 pawn. Which means that if white plays f3 in this position to try to get the bishop back, then I just immediately snap on h5. And this is a big problem, because if white can't play f3, then again, he's effectively playing uh, down a piece. Of course, I'm reminded of the famous game uh, Winter versus Capablanca, where with this structure, double def pawns, white's bishop was just absolutely uh, buried on the king side. Um, the engine points out actually the best move for white is bishop h2, which I find absolutely uh, shocking. I definitely didn't consider this one during the game. But the point is, this is a different way for white to play g4, and hopefully one day the bishop can get back into the game via f3 and bishop to g1. But this is so slow that I think uh, neither myself nor my opponent seriously uh, considered this one. Or, or maybe he did, but to me, I, I, I didn't even think the move was uh, possible. <laughs> um, in any case, white goes bishop to b3, and uh, just sacrifices the pawn, which I think was a good practical try because... Um, if he doesn't play f3 here, then I'm just going knight c5, knight d3, b5, and yeah, just playing uh, up a piece. Um, so he tries bishop b3, I take on h5, knight c4. And now there's some tricks in the position I had to avoid. For example, bishop f7, knight takes a5, uh, white wins the pawn back. And if I play uh, knight c5, for example, um, or excuse me, if I play uh, bishop c5, then white has knight takes e5. And I can't take because of bishop takes e5 mate. So I need to keep my bishop on f8 so that against this idea I have uh, bishop to g7. And uh, instead I decided to play b5, which I think was, was quite good. Um, knight c5 followed by knight d7 just defending this pawn. Just leaves black with an extra pawn in a good position. But I figured, okay, b5 is how I have to kind of win the game. So uh, might as well do it now. Uh, so takes takes knight e3, knight c5, bishop c2. Uh, bishop f7, f3. And here I really strongly considered the right move, uh, knight a4. Um, with, I had some interesting uh, ideas in mind here. My point was that if white takes on a4 and I take back, I'm simply pushing a3 next and trying to make a pass pawn. Um, so one line I calculated was knight d5, takes, takes, a3. Let's say takes, takes. And I wasn't totally sure about this one because now white gets you know two connected passers. Um, but black's a pawn is simply uh, faster. I think black has different ways of winning the game, but the simplest is to just uh, run the pawn down the board. And as it turns out, black is the one um, that's promoting with uh, with check and, and winning the game. Um, if I was too slow here, I think what would also be winning uh, would be to just bring the king in in order to uh, stop white's pawns. Um, because once white's pawns get stopped, it's going to be very difficult for white's bishop to ever deal uh, with the a pawn. So kind of, a, I felt like, instructive moment there. Um, what ended up discouraging me from this one was that white could play this move knight to c2, and then I actually just didn't see how I'm breaking through here, because the knight is just going to a3 and just blockading my pawns. Um, the engine points out a really fantastic idea, perhaps I should have noticed this one, um, but that is the move g4, which is not just trying to undermine white structure, one idea of course is to take and give black a, a passed h-pawn, um, the other idea is to of course go after the e-pawn, but the real point is that it opens up this diagonal for the bishop. So now black can go like bishop b3, knight a3, bishop h6, uh, and that's it. White's position just collapses, and uh, yeah, black breaks through. So I, I think if I spent more time on this one, I, I likely would have found this g4 idea. I guess something in the back of my mind was kind of skeptical of this one, uh, but I, I thought that was kind of an instructive point. So not really seeing a clear path to victory after knight a4, I decide, okay, let's just play it slow. So I played h5 here, bishop f2, king g7, just getting the king in. Uh, now white goes knight d5, which I think is very natural, just trying to go after uh, black's queenside pawns. Uh, here I thought for quite a while, and uh, I ended up deciding to take this knight. Objectively, this was probably not best, 
Uh, something like 96 would be keeping the position very stable. But my point was after taking uh, to play this move knight to b7, of course I really don't want to allow some kind of position with opposite color bishops. Even with one extra pawn, two extra pawns, you know, the, the positions can be uh, very, very drawish. I'm also thinking about, you know, the long-term future, and it's like I have this, uh, you know, extra pawn or two on the king side, um, but the h-pawn is going to be the wrong color for my bishop, so that would complicate the task uh, even further. Um, so the idea with knight b7 is to avoid this trade and instead set up a trade of bishops. If I can trade off uh, my bishop for the dark square bishop, um, then it, I think it would just be completely winning for black. Um, so white has to be very precise here. He goes bishop d3. Uh, I play knight d6 to defend the pawn. And now my point is on bishop c5. I have this nice move knight c4. And uh, white can't take this one because I have bishop takes c5 check. If white instead takes on f8, king takes f8, he pretty much has to take on c4. Otherwise, okay, his queen side is collapsing. But this king and pawn end game is just completely lost. Uh, I'm up a pawn, and as soon as white's king approaches the e4 square, I just push f5, and white's king never gets in. So instead, he found uh, what I definitely thought was the best try, bishop to b6. Though the engine points out that actually king f1 was the move, which is a tough move to play because it allows knight c4, and and now like b3 I have knight d2 check, uh, let's say takes or king e2 takes takes, and uh, any kind of position like this I actually thought I would have uh, quite serious winning chances because uh, both of white's pawns are blockaded. I have a really nice dark square blockade, and if white wants to avoid the trade of bishops, you know bishop has to go super passive. Not the clearest position in the world, uh, but I think black would still have decent winning chances here. Objectively, that's what white should have done, but I, I really felt like bishop b6 was a critical try. Uh, just going after the pawns and actually setting a pretty nasty trap. Um, for instance, if black plays a4 here, then white plays bishop c7, hoping to take the knight and take on b5. And then after knight c4, takes, takes, white has d6. And actually, white is the one promoting uh, his pawn first. I would have to give up my bishop and... You know, I didn't think too long whether I'm, I'm holding it or losing it. All I knew is that, okay, I don't want to give up a piece. Um, so it was important for me to find a key idea in this position after bishop b6, which is knight c4, which I'm happy to say I, I kind of saw um, from afar. And the point is that I'm actually giving back the pawn, but I'm forcing white to give up the bishop pair. And then after he takes on a5, I get bishop c5 check, king f1, king f7. And we reached this endgame with same color bishops where I felt like strategically uh, black was just doing excellent. White's deep pawn is uh, a real weakness, and my c4 pawn uh, is not only stopping two pawns um, on the queen side for white, it's also kind of like an untouchable pawn. Like white's king has no way of approaching the pawn, um, even if I get move my bishop off of this diagonal, the king can't come to the d4 square. Bishop of course can't attack it. And if white tries the plan of, let's say, bringing the king to c2 and pushing b3, well, by then I'm just going to be pushing on the king side and making a very distant pass pawn. So white basically just never has enough time to bring the king uh, over to the queen side. Um, so we tried bishop to b4. I briefly considered trading bishops here and going for the king and pawn endgame. Uh, let's say king e7, b5, here, here. But I was really, really unclear about this one because um, my king is now stuck. You know, I can't ever take either of these pawns, and I simply wasn't sure if my pawns are going to promote on, on the king side. I mean, it was kind of interesting. For example, like if white plays, let's say, g3 here, and I go h4, takes, takes, and something like king g2, e4, then black wins. And this is actually kind of a good rule to know. Uh, most people know about, like, the square of the pawn, but this is actually the, uh, or the, the rule of the square, but this is actually the second rule of the square which is that when you have two pawns and you're trying to figure out if the king can stop them, um, if the pawns themselves, let's say the square you make with the pawns, reaches the back rank, then uh, they're unstoppable and they're going to be promoting. But if we move the pawns back one, one uh, rank uh, to e5 and h5, then white's king would actually be in time to stop them. It's kind of a weird uh, phenomenon because, of course, I'm not able to take either of these pawns that are closer together, but the fact that these pawns are farther apart uh, in some cases, it is not a good thing. But in this case, white's king is not stopping them because they're simply uh, too far advanced. But I really, really wasn't sure if, if I'm going to win this one. Um, the engine points out an amazing move f4 that apparently saves it for white. And yeah, it turns out uh, black has nothing better than uh, a draw here. Like takes, 
takes, for example, and um, yeah, neither king will be able to make progress. So I usually don't go for king and pawn end games unless you know I'm absolutely sure, and I think that's it's a good habit to follow. Instead, I, I just go bishop b6 because I, I believed in my position, and yeah, now the plan is just to bring the king over to d7, one day challenge white on this diagonal, push f5, g4, and just start getting my play going. And yeah, very difficult for white to create a significant counterplay here. So bishop d6, king e8, king e2, king d7, bishop f8. Um, now the simplest was probably f5. I was a little bit unsure about what happens if white goes like g4 here, but black can just take and uh, this one is winning, the king will get in. Um, but I decided to, to go a different path. I went bishop d8 here, and now my point is I'm going to challenge the bishop on e7. So after king e3, bishop e7, again, the king and pawn endgame would be lost. For example, king e4. Here I don't get f5, but I can play something like g4 or king d6 first. Uh, and the point is, you know, virtually black is a pawn up here because this pawn on c4 is stopping two, and I have three versus two on the other side of the board that are very mobile. So for example, king f5, king d6. And uh, regard well, white can't take this pawn because of e4. But after it takes, takes um, this one is uh, just winning for uh, for black king f5 e4 and uh, king f4 f5 for example. And then let's say g4, I can take take king e5 and and yeah, it's just completely winning. Uh, in fact, what I found fascinating is that even this is winning. Takes 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 king f4. I push takes king e4. I'm down a pawn, but my king is getting uh, into the action. First, I'm taking both of white's pawns, and because of the fifth rank rule, white is never making a draw in the eventual king and pawn endgame. Um, so that one uh, was, of course, completely lost. Instead, white decided to uh, keep the bishop on the board. But now the bishop simply gets trapped here on the king side. I immediately go king e8 to try and uh, rile up the bishop. Um, and yeah, now if white plays king e4, for example, I'll go king f7. And let's say if bishop h8, I actually didn't really want to bother with calculating all these variations like king g8, king f5, and maybe white's king gets active as well. Instead I probably was just going to play king g6, uh, and then like bishop d6, f5, pretty much slow play it, and yeah, white is just uh, completely lost with, with no counterplay. Um, so he tried kind of the only move here, which is d6. I can't take because f6 hangs, but I do have bishop d8. Now king e4, king f7. Um, I briefly considered what happens here if king d5 takes and takes, you know, white tries to get some counterplay. But again, black's king side is just simply too fast. And I think I found the fastest way would actually be uh, to just go e4. Threatening to take, and then if white takes, then I go h4, g4, h3, and um, yeah, white's king is, um, well, is just going to have to immediately start running back, which gives me time to, to pick up all of white's um, other pawns as well. Um, so, Instead, after king f7, white played bishop h6, um, but now king e6, and at this point that's uh, game over because I'm getting f5 in, and white's king is going to be boxed out. I'm going to pick up the d pawn, and again, no counterplay. Um, he played bishop f8, and yeah, originally my thought was just f5 here, and you know, again, push the king away, but then I realized actually after bishop b6, the king is just getting mated in the center of the board uh, with f5. So. Um, yeah, once I saw this one, I immediately realized this is much stronger. If white plays g4, stopping the mate threat, then I just have h4, and the pawn is uh, unstoppable. Um, so he has to do like something like f4, and then I take this one, and again, it's uh, completely over. Uh, so after bishop b6, it was just uh, resigns. So yeah, I thought this was an interesting endgame. I'm really happy with uh, my decision to give back the pawn and, and play knight c4 and go into this uh, same color bishop endgame. And uh, yeah, the opening kind of turned out well, although, you know, clearly uh, I misplayed things from there and, and gave my opponent some chances in the middle game. But overall, I was happy with this one. So now I'm on two out of three. Uh, round four is actually going to be starting pretty soon, so I should probably go prep for that. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.